That's my real name. Just so you don't think you're pronouncing an appetizer on an Italian menu, I go by the way. Make a little easier for you. And we are going to talk today about one of the subjects that I absolutely adore, and that's goal setting. Now, over the week, I've got some really cool stories to share with you about goal setting. But when Matt approached me about this particular class, uh, Become Unstoppable, that was a very interesting name for the event. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? How am I going to approach this material? And, you know, it, it came back to me. If you want to be unstoppable, what you need is something to be unstoppable toward. Well, that toward is the goal. So what I'd like to do then is spend a little time kind of de deconstructing the model for goal setting. And I'll tell you why I like to do this, folks. I, there are three things that I absolutely adore in life. The first thing is research. I love being able to go and find complex information. The second thing I love to do is to distill that information, to make it simple. Then the third thing I love to do is to be able to share that information. So this notion of goal setting, while it may seem simple, simple it's deceptive in its relative simplicity. If I asked 100 people, how many of you are goal setting or are good at goal setting, I'd see 100 hands go up. Well, maybe 98, but a couple of people will both say. But in general, the vast majority of the hands will go up. Fact of the matter is, though, if you look at the number of goals that have actually been set versus the number of goals that have actually been achieved, it's a woefully low number. And what that tells me is that people really don't understand the method or the methodology or the model for setting goals. The method, the model for goal setting is an extremely important process. And I, I think this gets away from a lot of people. So what I'd like to do uh, over the course of today and the next time that I'm speaking, which I believe is Wednesday, two days from now, I'd like to develop this model of goal setting. By the way, the notion of goal setting goes back quite a ways. Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung actually talked about setting goals in some of their earlier writings. So this is a relatively older topic that has a lot of modern emphasis and import to it. Now to begin with, what I'd like to do is to ask a very simple question. In general, what brings us all here? Can you think of one word that brings us all here? Information. Information. Okay. One of you might say wealth. Somebody might say notoriety. Somebody might say fame, fortune, etc. But I think if we distill this notion of why we're here, we can actually have it come down to one word. We are all here to become more successful. Would you agree with that? We are all here to become more successful. Now, if you agree with me on that, that begs a second level question. What is success? And this is a very difficult question. Because if you think about it, if you think of Warren Buffett, for example, Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha, uh, worth, I don't know, $90 billion, um, uh, great family life, great uh, social network. By every standard, he was successful. Would you agree? And by the same token, if you look at somebody like Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, who uh, basically started a, an order of nuns that wrapped around the world, she uh, gleaned so much money from individuals to open up halfway homes and orphanages and AIDS foundations, etc. By any stretch of the imagination, Mother Teresa was successful. However, isn't it fair to say that Mother Teresa and Warren Buffett are very, very different individuals? So what we need to do is capture a definition of success, a definition of success that works just as well for a Warren Buffett as it does for a Mother Teresa. So what I'd like to do is to throw out a couple adjectives to you. And let's see if after I throw these adjectives out, we can come up with a definition of success. When I look at the word success, the first thing I think of is progressive. Progressive. 
Now, what do I mean by that? When I say that success is progressive, you heard of the old saying that it's not just the destination, it's the journey, etc. You don't all of a sudden become successful. Success is a process, ladies and gentlemen. It is not an event. If you are a mean, rotten SOB and you win the lottery tonight, tomorrow you are going to be a mean, rotten, rich SOB. But nothing else has changed. The end result is, is that this notion of success means that it's a journey. Now here's the value of this, and please note this well. If I asked you the question, if you set a goal, and you set up the steps to accomplish that goal, and you achieve the goal, are you successful at the end of that goal setting process? Most individuals would intuitively say, of course you are. That's not what progressive tells us. What progressive tells us is that when we set a goal and we modify our behavior, goal setting is one of the greatest behavior modification tools in existence. As we set a goal and as we modify our behavior, that is when we become successful. We become successful at the beginning of the goal setting process, not at the end of it. At the end of the process, when we've accomplished the goal, it should almost look like it's deja vu. Are you with me? That's the notion of progressive in terms of success. There's no such thing as all of a sudden, ladies and gentlemen. There is no such thing as all of a sudden. That goes with anything and it goes with success. So success is progressive. Success also has to do with the notion of realization. Now, what do I mean by realization? I think Nike said it best in their original tagline, just do it. In other words, we need to accomplish the action steps necessary for us to become successful. Now, I love this notion of, uh, of realization in terms of success, and just do it is a great way to uh, think about it. I'll give you another acronym for it. Did you ever hear that, Goya? Here's what it means in terms of success and in terms of setting goals. Get off your backside. Okay, that's part of being successful. You know, here, here we are. This is how nice and quiet it is. If we went through this process and I asked you to start setting goals and you start jotting them down, you'd have a hundred of them. But tomorrow, guess what you have to do? Execute. You gotta put them into practice, exactly. So. When we say realization, what we mean is that we need to put the goals into action. It's one thing to set the goals, but it's another thing to sit on the leather couch, break open a beer, and say, I'll get to that at some point. That's not the way success works, okay? So, success has to do with progressive. It has to do with realization. Success is also worthwhile. Now, let me ask you something, W-H-I-L-E. As, as you become more successful, who is it worthwhile to? As you set your goals, you accomplish them? To you, absolutely. Anybody else? Could be. Yeah, how about your family? Sometimes. Sometimes, how about your coworkers? As you become more successful, as they see your behavior modifying toward a particular goal, is that helpful toward other people? Could very well be. And I want you to think about this, ladies and gentlemen. I've just mentioned family, friends, coworkers. These are all people that you know. Something very interesting. Can your level of success actually be worthwhile to people that you don't know? How many people see you on a daily basis that may not know you? But they see you. I mean, think about how many people you see on a daily basis and you, know, you, you, you kind of know their behavior. The person that you buy your newspaper off, uh, the person that uh, empties the garbage in your office building, etc. As you change, that change may be noticeable to them, and they might say, I don't know what they're doing, but I want a piece of that, and they're gonna change. Isn't that something? 
So we have the ability to change a tremendous amount of individuals by changing ourselves in terms of what we're looking for. Remember what we're talking about here. Become unstoppable. Become unstoppable. Unstoppable toward what? Toward the goals. Worthwhile. As, our, as we achieve our goals by modifying our behavior, it becomes worthwhile to a bevy of individuals, even individuals we may not know. So success is progressive. It has to do with realization. Success is worthwhile. Success is also predetermined. Predetermined. Now, what do I mean by that? Do we know in advance what we are looking to accomplish? It's ex extremely important. You know, in strategic planning, you're in with the board of directors and you're, you're talking about strategy. One of the first things you want to do is figure out what it is you're trying to hit. Predetermined. Too many times, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm sure you'll agree with me on this. Individuals who set goals that are not quite as personally competitive as what they should be, instead of aiming at the bullseye, they grab an arrow out of their quiver, put it in the bow and shoot it. Then wherever that arrow hits, they say, yeah, that's the spot. That's the opposite of what we're trying to do. This is called a settle for goal, a settle for goal. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. An individual says, I'm going to set a goal for a new vehicle. Really? What kind of leather interior do you want? Oh, I think I'm going to get cloth. Leather's too expensive. That's a settle for a goal. I'm going to set a goal to build a new house. Great. Now, I know when we were talking, you said you need about four bedrooms for your expanding family. Yeah, but I'm only going to make it three bedrooms. Four bedrooms is a little too much money. That's a settle for goal. Okay. Know in advance what you're looking for. Predetermined. If you do that, what you will end up with is not a settle for goal, but a goal that gives you the ability to strive, to move forward, to get ahead. Success. Progressive. Realization. Worthwhile. Predetermined. Success is also personal. Personal. No matter what happens, ladies and gentlemen, success has to be a personal level of commitment. We have to feel personally involved. Now, you know, a lot of times, if I am uh, going through this model on a corporate level, they say, well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're talking about um, uh, success on the corporate level. You know what? It all devolves into what's in it for you. It all devolves into personal. Motivation is personal. And the ability to motivate yourself toward a goal, even if it's a business goal, is still personal. You know, how many of us love our work? How many of us would do it for free? Fact of the matter is, is that you need some level of personal compensation. So when we say that success is personal, we don't necessarily mean that it's the opposite of organizational goals. It's an adjunct to it. And then finally, success has to do with the notion of goals. Okay, now I said to you, can we come up with a definition of success that would work just as well for somebody like Warren Buffett as it does for a Mother Teresa? How about this, folks? Success is the progressive realization of worthwhile, predetermined, personal goals. Do you see in this definition, progressive, realization, worthwhile, predetermined, personal goals, do you see financial gain in there? Nope. Do you see spiritual gain in there? What you are looking at is an empty bucket. This is a bucket. It's a, it's a psychological bucket, it's a behavioral bucket, and guess what it gives you the ability to do? Fill it with whatever you want. Okay, 
That's the value of this. You know, uh, there was a study done. Oh my goodness, it, it had to be 50 years by now. It actually, uh, I, I read about it, I think in like 1980 BC. That means before computers. Uh, so I can't even research it. I don't even know where to find it. Uh, uh, but a study was done, I believe it was Yale University, where uh, they did a study of individuals who had specific goals, uh, written goals, and were making progress toward them. It was 3% of the, of the respondees. 3% of the respondees of a, of a Ivy League university had specific written goals and were making progress toward them. 10% had goals and they were making progress toward them, but they weren't written down. They weren't crystallized. They weren't as clear as what they should be. 27% had very short-term goals, the next raise, the next vacation, and 60% had no goals. Now, that's the way the study looked. 3%, 10%, 27%, 60%. 60%. When you superimposed how uh, the, uh, the net worth of the individuals over that, the 3% were amongst the highest net worth individuals on the planet. Uh, so much, in fact, that the difference between the top of the 3% and the bottom of the 3%, there's a 2,000% difference. Uh, the 10% were, were very comfortable. The 27% were basically the middle class. And the 60%, they were in trouble. Many of them needed assistance. They needed help to move beyond where they were. So consequently, the notion of gold is not just a psychological, uh, a psychological process, it's also a financial process. This is a psychological model that if we alter our behavior toward this, we can in fact get whatever it is we want. Money is one of the easiest things to measure because you can count it, but it's not necessarily the criteria for success, okay? All right, so with that then, Let's talk about the notion of goals. And what I would like to do is set up this technique called SMART goals, S-M-A-R-T. And I gave you another T with the period in, uh, with, uh, in the uh, parentheses. Let's talk about that a little bit. What is a SMART goal? Well, I guess to begin with, what's the opposite of a SMART goal? You might say the opposite of a SMART goal is a dumb goal, but it's not. The opposite of a SMART goal is no goal at all. SMART has to be hit for us to call this a goal. Every one of those letters have to be ticked off. Okay, so let's begin. S, what is S? Goals have to be specific. They have to be specific. The end result is you need to know in advance what you are looking to accomplish. Goals need to be known in advance. And when we say specific, we have to know not just the end result, but the methodology. Okay, so see, you know what that was? That was the feedback from my heart because I'm so passionate about this, okay? so. Anyway, it's not just the um, it's not just the result; it's the methodology. Now, for example, uh, I, I want to set a goal to lose some weight. Well, you know, I can clip my fingernails. I can certainly lose weight that way, but it's not the intent. Okay, I can go for a haircut. That I can lose weight there. That's not the intent. Okay, the goal is to know what it is you want, but then also to know the intent behind it. So when we say specific. We need to know exactly what we're looking at, and we need to be able to find ways to get there. This is a problem for a lot of people, ladies and gentlemen. It really is. It's a problem for a lot of people. Now, it's not a problem for you people that are looking to become unstoppable, okay? But it's a problem for a lot of people because we try to rationalize our way to shortcuts. We try to rationalize our way to uh, trap doors that'll let us out, escape clauses or escape hatches. Uh, that'll let us out of the situation if necessary. Unstoppable people who set specific goals know that what they are looking to accomplish, there's no negotiations. They're going to accomplish it, okay? That's the notion of specificity in goals, okay? Goals also, yes, Connor? 
Oh, I'm sorry. That's, somebody said something. Goals also have to be measurable. Measurable. You know, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. I have been teaching principles of management at both the graduate and undergraduate level for almost 40 years. And the first thing that I say in my first management class of the semester is this. Students, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And without a measurement in place, we're in trouble. Now, I'm going to spend a little time on this because I think this is really important. Think about this. Let's say you just got your taxes done and you called your accountant. You wanted to know what your refund's going to be. And your accountant says, oh, quite a bit. What did he just tell you? He told you nothing. He told you nothing. What is quite a bit? Is that something we can measure? No, no, not at all. It's something, it's, it, it's unmeasurable. You know, I, I ask this a lot, especially in my management classes of students. How many of you would like to earn over your career a lot of money? Guess how many hands go up? All of them. I mean, these are classes of business students, right? These aren't social workers, these are business students. So, so they all say, I want to earn a lot of money. I say, all right, I want to, I want to take you back to um, high school algebra. Do you remember the notion of a number line? Minus infinity in one direction, positive infinity on the other, with zero bisecting it in the middle. Y'all remember this? How many numbers are on that number line? Infinite, correct? How many numbers are between any two numbers? Infinite. So I said, all of you want to earn a lot of money. Please tell me. Where is that number? Where's that number at? Normally the answer I get, well, it's to the right of zero. But is that a measurable number? You can't measure it, you can't manage it. One of the most important things that we need to understand is that goals have to have a measurable component. Now I said I'm gonna spend a little time with this. Goals fall into two primary categories, tangible goals, <coughs> excuse me, and, uh, and intangible goals. Tangible goals are things that we want. Intangible goals are things that we want to become. So for example, a tangible goal might be, I want a new car. An intangible goal might be, I want to develop a level of patience with my employees so I can listen to them better. Now, do you see how one is tangible, one is intangible? Tangible goals are easy, you can count them. So for example, if you wanted to go on vacation next year and it was going to cost you $2,000 and you had a year to save for it and you had an envelope, every week you put $40 in the envelope. At the end of 50 weeks, you got $2,000. Tangible goal, with a tangible goal, you know how far away you are from the result and you know by how much. Okay, I got $1,000, I have $1,000 to go. Does that make sense? That's the notion of a tangible goal. Tangible goals, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, they're fun, they're sexy, they're easy to count. All right, everybody loves tangible goals. Intangible goals, the things that we wanna become, they're hard, they're not sexy, they're not fun. Developing a level of patience, becoming a more empathetic listener. These things are hard because they go against what your behavioral repertoire is to date. So it's very, very difficult to uh, work with intangible goals. Now you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute. If tangible goals are fun and sexy and intangible goals are not fun and hard, why don't I just set tangible goals? Because I think this is one of the laws of the universe. You don't have to agree with it, but I personally think it is. Before you can have more, you need to become more. If you think about it in terms of um, working for a corporation, if you work hard all year, at the end of the year, when it's time for a review, you get your review and what else do you get? Raise. Hopefully a raise, right? That raise is reflective of what you've done in the past year. So what the corporation is telling you is that you have become more 
in this last year. You have become more worthwhile to us. And the end result is you're going to get an additional level of tangibility of compensation the next year. So that's the notion of worthwhile, of, I'm sorry, of how intangible and tangible goals work. Here's the problem. How do we measure an intangible goal? $2,000 in an envelope is easy. If I miss a week, I got to put 80 in the next week. If my aunt sent me an extra $40 uh, for a birthday present and I put it in the envelope, I could take a week off. How do you measure intangible goals? Like for example, how to become a more empathetic listener. For example, how to become a better communicator. Well, you need to come up with a measurement tool. Let me give you a quick and dirty tool for intangible goal tracking. And this has worked a million times. It's a process that I like to call the one to 10 system. And what you do in this process is simply track your own behavior. Now you gotta be honest with yourself. Let's say for example, um, you have low organizational skills. You go into your office in the morning, you look at your desk, and you realize that the Formica on that desk has not seen sunlight since the second Reagan administration. Okay, so you wanna do something about that. What are you gonna do about it? You're gonna get organized. So let's say on a weekly basis, assuming you only work five days a week, every day you go into that office and at the end of the day, you assess where you are organizationally. Now you know where you are. You know where you're at. You know whether or not you've been more organizationally fit or not. So let's say Monday, you give yourself a seven. Let's say Tuesday, you give yourself a two. Wednesday, things are going really well, you give yourself a nine. And let's say you give yourself a six and a seven. At the end of the week, folks, remember this is measuring an intangible goal. There are two days that I wanna concentrate on. Do you know which two days they are? I wanna concentrate on Tuesday and I wanna concentrate on Wednesday. So Saturday morning, I'm gonna be sitting down with a cup of coffee or my favorite morning beverage, and I want to be able to say, what went wrong on Tuesday and not do that anymore? And then I wanna say, what went right on Wednesday? And I wanna do more of that. And that's how we measure an intangible goal. And that's how we begin the growth process toward tangibility through the intangible process. And that's how we measure. Does that make sense? Yes. Good, okay. I had a, uh, a client that, uh, great, great, great person. He uh, managed a um, plastics facility in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And uh, great guy, uh, he, I mean, this is a $55 million facility. So he was the general manager, he was the plant manager. So basically he was the CEO of a $55 million company. Not bad. His boss wanted to promote him. His name was Danny, but Danny had a problem. Danny's problem was that when he got mad, he would let out in a litany of curses that would make a longshoreman blush. And that, when he went into the executive ranks, that couldn't happen. So his boss wanted me to help Danny with his cursing. So the first thing I said is, would a gag work? Here's what we did. He gave Danny an index card. He put it in his pocket. And every time Danny cursed, he gave himself a little hash mark, right? Well... I would go up on a weekly basis and I would coach him and we would talk about that and he would tell me what each emotional response was to the curses and we were having a little bit of luck with it. He, it was trending down, but not by a great amount. Everybody knew Danny's problem. Everybody knew he had his index card in his top pocket. One day I was in the factory with Danny. He was showing me a new machine and an employee came up to him and said, hey, Danny, we had a problem on line three last night. We had about $10,000 worth of scrap. 
Now remember, $10,000 in a $55 million facility is not that really big of a deal. They spend more than $10,000 on coffee mates. So anyway, um, Danny went ballistic. He said, I told him last night that that machine was going out of control and he let into a litany of curses and the employee was just standing there like this. After about 30 seconds, 45 seconds, Danny's emotions abated. He decompressed. And what the employee did was pull an ink pen out of his pocket, went up to Danny, pulled the card out of his pocket, and gave him a whole bunch of stick figures, put it back in his pocket, and walked away. And Danny's looking at me, and I'm looking at him and say, what? That's when he learned to control his emotions toward cursing. That's what the measurement process does. I've got more stories for you on that, but we're limited on time. Just so you understand, that's how it works. So remember, goals have to be specific. Goals have to be measurable. What's the A in SMART? Goals have to be attainable. And let me give you a synonym for the word attainable. Believable. They have to be believable. But guess who they have to be believable to? To you, the person who's setting the goal and the person that has to achieve the goal. You can't have another person set your goals for you. You have to set them yourself. Jim Rohn said it best. He said, you can't pay somebody else to do your push-ups. All right. And the result is you've got to be able to set up your own goals. And you have to be comfortable with them. This, this, this has been a problem with so many managers that have, have understood the goal setting process. They want to set goals for their employees. They don't want to have a, a, a collaborative union with the employees and have them give and take. They want to set the goals. I mean, folks, Peter Drucker talked about this back in the 1950s about setting collaborative goals. This is not exactly cutting edge management science. Okay, so you have to work with your people to help them set goals. This is a great parenting tool. You know, I was able to get both of my boys from Tiger Cub to Eagle Scout. And I got to tell you, I got to tell you, it was a difficult process, especially with my younger son. A couple of times I wanted to smother him with a pillow, but I didn't. Uh, cause I get, cause I, I learned how to control myself with patience. See, that's the goal setting process. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the point though is, is that what we did is we set goals. We set. now I didn't go through this process with them, but I helped them set goals. You need to get four merit badges this month. You need to go from life scout to you know, whatever it was beyond. I don't know what, whatever it was beyond life scout, but you need to do that by the end of this year and so forth. And that's how we work the process out. I don't even think they knew I did it. But it got them there. It got them to Eagle Scout. Okay, that's part of what the uh, the, the attainable attainable process is. It's it's kind of bantering with your people. It's dickering with them. It's making sure that you're all comfortable setting goals, and for you personally, that you set them. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a caveat here. When you set your goals, you need to be careful. This has to do with the R in the SMART criteria realistic. You have to make sure that your goals are realistic to, no, no, this is personal, to you. To, in, in quiet situations like this, we could set up goals. And I want you to set up stretch goals. I want you to be able to move your goals forward, to do more, etc. But if you set your goal too high, if you set your goal that where it's going to be relatively impossible to hit, at that point, failure can become a habit. And that's one of the, that's one of the kisses of death to goal setting. So you want to be careful with that process. Okay. When you set goals, you want to make sure that those goals are realistic. Are you with me? Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, timely time specific goals need to have a deadline now you're all here on a nice vacation aren't you how would you like to take a vacation to a tropical island set a goal without a deadline and then you can go to someday isle because someday never comes 
Someday never comes. If you set a goal without a deadline, you are giving yourself enough wiggle room to fail at the goal and restart and to do this often. In other words, you're beginning to rationalize procrastination. Okay. Oh, I can't believe I fell off the wagon. I'm going to start my goal again tomorrow. Oh, I can't believe I fell off the wagon again. Don't you worry. The beginning of the month, I'm starting again. And when you put a deadline on a goal, you set yourself up psychologically so that you begin to make micro adjustments subconsciously. You set yourself up metaphysically because the universe is helping you to discover what you need to discover. And it's just, it's just, the, and you know what, even if you're, if you're a religious individual, you're setting yourself up theologically because God helps those who helps themselves. Okay. So it doesn't matter whether you're setting yourself up psychologically, uh, metaphysically, or theologically, you're coming up with the same answer. Put a deadline on a goal and you'll begin to move your agendas forward and you'll hit that deadline as long as it's realistic. Then I gave you a T in parentheses. Normally, if, if, you, if you dive into success literature, you will find smart goals with one T. But I gave you another T in parentheses. Uh, some of the research that I've done on goal setting over the years has led me to the second T, which I like to call tangible, tangibility. And here's what I mean by that. When we set up goals for ourselves, we want to enrich ourselves with as much sensory input as possible. Well, we have five highways to the brain, five senses. And those senses, the more that we can get those senses involved, the greater the ability to accomplish a goal. So for example, If there's a particular car that you want, you got that car envisioned in your mind, do you know what color it is? Do you know what the interior looks like? Do you know what the engine looks like? You see, we're going through this visualization process, but it's only visual. What I've told a lot of clients was this, go down to the dealership that has that exact car that you want, sit in it. Everybody have the smell of the new car in their mind? Isn't that a lovely smell? Now you're getting all the factory senses involved in it. He used to tell us that the car was sitting in. Did you teach him that? He probably stole it off me. <laughs> uh, also, take it for a test ride. Feel it. The tactile feel. Not only that, you're hearing the engine, you're hearing, do you see how you're getting four of the five senses involved? Hell, lick the steering wheel if you want to, get taste involved too, that's up to you. But the point though is that you got all these four senses involved in the process. Well, that tangibility creates different connections to the mind. And all of these create this motivational process that will assist us in moving forward the goals that we want. Does this make sense, folks? Now, as I said, this is kind of an abbreviation, but I, this is a, gi a gigantically exciting process to me. I've, I've got a couple stories for you over the next couple days that I think you're really going to be uh, riveted with because they're true stories. They're stories that help me evolve in the goal setting process. I'm a goal setter now by nature because I've been doing it now for 35 or 40 years. And it's, it's by nature that it just, it just become uh, so natural for me to do. And I love the process. Let me go a little bit further. If this system works, if goal setting works, really works, why don't more people do it? Or why do so many people fail at doing it, which is the vast majority? They don't know it, they don't believe it. Yeah, well, let, let, they don't know, okay? That is definitely one reason. Some people simply don't know how to set goals. That's what this is about. This is about the knowing. Some people, many people have not gone through this, so they don't know how. Would you agree with me too that some people are just plain lazy? They would prefer to sit on the leather couch, crack open a beer, and binge watch something on Netflix. Or 
they had, could have a fear that if they start something, they'll fail. So why start it? What you're, yes, absolutely. What you are talking about is something called fear of success, where we can rationalize not setting a goal because we don't want to fail, right? What's the best way? I, um, what's one of the best ways not to fail? Don't start. don't start. Okay, we can fear success, and the flip side of that is fear of failure which there's been tremendous studies done on fear of failure with college students. Let me give you an example from Dennis Waitley. Dennis Waitley was a, uh, a psychologist who did a lot of his great works in the 1980s and 1990s with uh, uh, Olympic uh, athletes and uh, NASA. And he's still actually, and uh, POWs out of Vietnam, he's still doing some work today. Uh, but when he was talking about fear of failure and fear of success, think about this. Uh, look at the size of these tiles. They've got to be at least two feet wide. So if I told you to go to one end and I put a $10 bill on the other end and I said, I want you to walk across this tile and if you don't deviate from the tile, you can go pick up the $10. How many of you would do it? Absolutely, right? I mean, very little risk, decent reward for what you're asking to do. $10 isn't going to make you rich, but you know what? It'll buy you lunch. In northeastern Pennsylvania, where I came from, it'll buy you lunch for three days. <laughs> so, so you, you, you got some, uh, you, you could do that. However, what if I took that same tile sequence and I put it on two skyscrapers in New York and said, walk across it now? Well, I added a pebble to the $10 too because it gets pretty breezy a quarter mile in the air. Most people won't do that. Think about the first example. What were you concentrating on? The success, what right, you would think about it. Think, think, you know, look, if you fell off the tile and it was on the ground, people would laugh at you and say, you had too much beer for breakfast, right? No big deal. But you were thinking about the 10 bucks. When you're a quarter mile in the air, what were you thinking of? Yeah, what happens if, okay, what about, this? One, one, we were thinking about success at one point, we were thinking about failure at the other. So these are reasons why people don't set goals. Here's another reason why people don't set goals. Have you ever heard of the notion of comfort zones? Okay, comfort zones are real. They are a psychological entity. If this circle here, if this circle uh, represents uh, the ability for me to behave, these blue X's in that area represent points of behavior. In other words, I feel comfortable inside the comfort zone. Whereas if I'm going to behave outside of the comfort zone, I feel by definition what? I feel uncomfortable. Where does the goal setting process take us? In the comfort zone or outside of it? See this point right here? This point is me waking up every morning at 5 a.m. and going outside for a two mile run. I do that now. So that's why it's in my comfort zone. I'm comfortable doing it. This is me waking up at 5 a.m. and going for a three mile run. Why is it outside, my comfort, uh, outside of my comfort zone? <laughs> I haven't done it. I feel uncomfortable with that extra mile. So the distance between the comfort zone and the new behavior, this is where we set a goal. Does that make sense? Okay, now, here's the value, folks. And please note this well. As I begin to accomplish this, does this point then go into my comfort zone? Does this new point of behavior go into my comfort zone? See, a lot of people will say yes, but it's not true. What happens is we begin to put lateral pressure on the comfort zone and the comfort zone expands. The comfort zone gets bigger. At birth, our comfort zone looks like this. And little by little, as we get bigger, it grows. And then eventually it becomes what it is as an adult. As we begin to accomplish new things, 
the comfort zone grows even more. Now, let me expand this a little bit further. Do you see this point right here? Before I set a goal to accomplish this, how did this point make me feel? I felt uncomfortable. But notice, as I set goals to accomplish this, what happened to this point? It grew into my comfort zone. You know, this is so cool. The, the research on new salespeople and the failure of new salespeople uh, brings this to, uh, to light. New salespeople basically fail for one of two reasons. They either suck at prospecting or they can't close the sale. If they suck at prospecting, it means they, they don't have the ability to knock on the door and say, can I see you? And if they suck at closing, what it means is they don't have the ability to say, hey, you know, press hard, you're making three copies. Okay, they, they, so they have a problem. Here's what we found out. If this is prospecting and this is closing, when they get better at one, guess what happens to the other? They get better at it. They get better at it. Okay? It's the same thing with kids. These kids that we call natural athletes. They pick up a basketball, they're great at it. So now they have, they're, gonna go, they're gonna go play baseball. They've never played baseball before. They were at ground zero with everybody else. But what did they bring to the baseball diamond? The self-confidence of shooting the baskets. So consequently, they get good at that. Here's the point, folks. People don't wanna set goals because this makes them feel uncomfortable. But look at the value. Look at what happens as you begin to expand your comfort zone. There's one other reason why people don't set goals. It's called conditioning. And we have all been conditioned over our lives. You know, if you've ever seen the way an elephant is tethered at the zoo, uh, well, actually, they don't use elephants at zoos anymore. Uh, but they have a rope tied around its leg. A circus, I'm sorry, a circus. Um, they have a rope tied around its leg. Well, I mean, you or I could break through that rope, but the elephant doesn't. Why not? Because it's conditioned. As it was a baby elephant and a steel chain was wrapped around its leg, it tugged and pulled, did everything it could, couldn't get away. When it stopped tugging and pulling, that's when the elephant trainer knew all we have to do is, make, is put pressure on the elephant's back leg and it's going to think it can't go anywhere. That's conditioning. Okay, um, a group of marine biologists did a uh, study back in the 60s. Uh, they introduced a um, Spanish mackerel into an aquarium with a barracuda. And, um, you know, barracudas love Spanish mackerels. And to be honest with you, with a nice balsamic reduction, of, uh, it's not, not that it's, <laughs> it's pretty good. Anyway, um, what they did was they put a glass partition in between the Spanish mackerel on one side and the barracuda on the other. The barracuda saw the Spanish mackerel, made a beeline toward it, but boom, bumped its nose on the glass. Try it again, boom, bumped its nose. Try it again, boom, bumped its nose. Pretty soon, the barracuda, it stopped trying. The marine biologists moved the glass. Guess what happened? Rip the hell out of him. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, what, what happened was the barracuda would not even try. Matter of fact, the barracuda and the Spanish mackerel ate from the same food source. If a new Spanish mackerel was introduced into the tank, the barracuda devoured it. But that one, it wouldn't. What did that Spanish mackerel remind the barracuda of? the pain of hitting its nose. It associated that barracuda with pain, and that's another reason why people don't say, oh, that's conditioning. The conditioning process happens. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, like it or not, mommy and daddy and preacher and teacher conditioned us to a large part to, be, to run with the rest of the uh, pack and to fly with the rest of the flock. Think about the things you heard when you were growing up. Don't talk to strangers. What happens when you start a new job? You go in the first day, who do you have around you? 
strangers. It's even worse if you're a salesperson. If you're a salesperson, you got to go to a stranger and ask him for $10,000. So the end result of that process is that you, you hear mommy and daddy and preacher and teacher. They're talking to you. Even though they might be decades dead, they're still talking to you. Zig Ziglar said it best. Zig Ziglar was a tremendous sales trainer. And he said, um, closing the sale is not between you and the prospect. Closing the sale is between you and your mother. And the reason he said that was because when you're trying to close a sale, you want that prospect to feel a little uncomfortable for solving their problems without your solution. So that you can close that gap and make them feel comfortable by using your solution. But mom's in the back of your head saying, you be nice to that person. Don't you dare make them feel uncomfortable because that's what moms do. It works the same in goal setting. We've heard this so many times in the conditioning process. The conditioning process makes us run with the rest of the pack, fly with the rest of the flock. Don't talk to strangers. A stitch in time saves nine. All of these things that we've heard over and over and over again in the past can affect us. They can keep us from achieving the things that we want to achieve. Okay, and don't forget, mom and dad and preacher and teacher didn't do this so that, they didn't do it because they were mean. They didn't do it because they didn't want us to succeed or to thrive. They did it because they wanted to keep us safe. They wanted to keep us from harm. They didn't want us to, they didn't want us to work that hard. You know, you go home and say, oh, mom, I got this great idea for a business. And mom says, oh, honey, that's going to take so much work. Don't worry about it. Dad was a failure. We loved him. The end result is they did everything they could to keep us comfortable. It reminds me of the Pink Floyd song, Mother. Part of what we have to do to become unstoppable is to get out of our comfort zone. Part of what we have to do to become unstoppable is to understand that these scripts that are playing in our head, that others put into our head back when we were kids, it's vaporware. It's gone. As I said, I got some stories to share with you. I came from a family of lunatic psychotics that did just that. But you can definitely squelch those voices. You can squelch them. And the more you squelch them, the more you realize that you are in charge of your destiny. You are in charge of your life. You can make the difference that you want to make. And you know what that is? Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, it's liberating. It gives you the ability to know you can do whatever you want to do in life. The only limits that we have are the limits that we self-impose. The pain, the discomfort. Those are the limits that we have. Once we get past them, everything, everything is open to us. So I'd like you to think about this as we progress over the next week toward this notion of becoming unstoppable. Ultimately, the unstoppability is you. You become unstoppable. Because whatever you vividly imagine, ardently desire, sincerely believe, and enthusiastically act upon, it must inevitably come to pass. It's up to you. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Bill Shaka here, welcoming you to another edition of the 5-Minute Motivator. Welcome to my home in Tamarindo, Costa Rica, where the sun is shining and the uh, air is spectacular and the birds are being a true pain in the ass but what are you going to do yep. and uh that gigantic mosquito that looked like a b-52 was ready to land on me the mosquitoes are amazing in the tropics and i don't just mean in costa rica i mean they were like this in thailand and in other areas that i travel to uh, they are literally like B-52s, and their proboscis is like a harpoon. Uh, they have a little meter on them to tell you how many, um, how many uh, 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 gallons or pints they're leaving with. Uh, but what are you going to do? Uh, anyway, what are we going to talk about today? How do we coach the bottom one-third of our employees? A sales manager called me and said, Bill, you know what? I find that 
if I break up my uh, uh, sales force into three groups, uh, the group that's above average, the average group, and the group that's below average, I don't have to coach my above average group. They know what they're doing. The average group, I coach them in terms of how to get them to the above average. What do I do with the bottom third? And you know, it's an interesting problem, uh, especially in terms of sales, uh, where I'm going to try to, uh, to focus this on. When an individual is driven by commission or the fact that they have to hold their salary position by selling something, it makes you kind of wonder why they aren't doing what they should be doing. Now, if you've been in sales management for a while, you know as well as I do, there are a billion excuses as to why we missed our quota. You know, uh, the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter is aligned with Mars. Uh, there, there's a million reasons. I want to break this down. I've done this in other episodes of the 5-Minute Motivator from a management perspective. Let's talk about this from a sales perspective. People go where they're wanted. They stay where they're appreciated. So here's the first question I have for you. Do the bottom third feel appreciated? Now, I know it's hard if they are consistently under quota to appreciate them. But here's a suggestion for you. One at a time, take them out to lunch. Tell them that you value their contribution, but that they really need to step up the quota production. And that's a way of tempering what may in fact become the inevitable. Look at, I've hired, I've hired uh, hundreds of salespeople in my career, and I fired hundreds of salespeople uh, in my career. And um, you know, it's funny, when you fire a salesperson, uh, it's never their fault, it's always your fault. I can't tell you how many salespeople I fired that say, well, you know, you sucked as a manager. Well, you know, uh, your products just weren't that good enough to sell. And, and, and you know what, I, I looked at, for example, the number of uh, salespeople that I made successful, and I know I didn't suck as a manager. I mean, could I get better? Of course I could, everybody can get better. Uh, I look at the products that were sold literally around the world, especially packaged products from third-party vendors, and I know that they sell well. No, I'm sorry, I have to hold a psychological mirror up to you. And some individuals that I really know, like, and respected, uh, I was harder on during the uh, uh, termination process because I wanted them to get better at their next job. Whether they did or not, I don't know. Uh, normally when you fire a salesperson, you, you don't send each other holiday cards. Uh, anyway, if a salesperson is having trouble in one aspect of sales, you can train them. Okay, If they don't know how to do something, you can train them. If they don't want to do something, that's different. That's, that's termination. If, they, if you're telling them to do something, I want you to make 100 phone calls uh, between 9 a.m. and uh, uh, noon, and they don't do it, that means they don't want to. Okay, And in that regard, uh, that means that you have every right in the world to start looking at the termination process uh, because they're not doing what they should be doing. Uh, so I, I want you to think about this. The best way to coach I think the bottom third is to um, help them uh, understand that their contribution is valuable. And it can be valuable if they, in fact, become average or above average. Uh, you know, a sales manager's job never ends. You are constantly looking at what you can do to raise the bar on your people because it's only going to make them more successful. It's going to make you more successful. It, the customers are going to be happier because they purchased. You know, ladies and gentlemen, a terrible thing happens if a sale doesn't occur nothing. We need to be able to make sure that our salespeople are trained to be the best that they can for themselves, for you, for the company, and for the world. Bill Shaka, thanking you for attending another edition of the 5-Minute Motor. Hey, Bill Shaka here. Welcome to another edition of the 5-Minute Motivator. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's edition on the new abnormal. Uh, I am. Uh, I, 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 I'm hoping that uh, uh, all of us can begin to uh, work together in getting back to what we consider to be normal workflow. Today, what I would like to discuss is this: Who says life is fair? Okay, let me tee this up. I have been blessed by working for some absolute brilliant managers. I had a sales manager early in my career 
that literally changed the trajectory of my life. Uh, that's what good managers and good leaders can do. And I've had several others. Uh, I've also been blessed with some brilliant teachers and academic mentors who have assisted me in uh, doing some wonderful research and being able to uh, uh, project myself uh, uh, and so forth in public speaking. Brilliant. I've also been blessed by working for some, well, how do I put this nicely? Idiots. Uh, individuals that, and I say I was blessed because what I did with the good managers, take what they've done and duplicated it, what I've done with some of these poor managers that I've worked for, and you know the difference. You know if you're working for a good person or a bad person. I've taken what they've done and I've reversed it. Well, I worked for one guy. His title was the Director of Academic Affairs, or the DAA, or what I like to call the DA. And um, he often said whenever he uh, uh, pontificated and bloviated and, and sent his uh, edicts down from on high that uh, life is not meant to be fair. And, uh, you know, w with my research into metaphysics and uh, uh, the law of attraction and so forth, I, I used to, they used to grind on me who says life isn't fair, who says life isn't perfect. It is. We get from life exactly what we gave it. Where are you in life right now? Pat yourself on the back. You got yourself there. Look at I'm patting myself on my back because I got to where I am. All right? There's, life is fair. Life exists and gives us exactly what we get, what we ask for. Life is a mirror, and we need to understand that life is fair. So when I used to hear that comment, life is not fair, they used to grind on me. It is fair. The only thing that I could suggest for individuals that believe that life isn't fair is that they believe that life exists in terms of externalities, that what they are going to do is uh, bob and weave uh, in terms of the flotsam and jetsams of what the universe has to offer. No way. We are the captains. We are the ones who command where we are going and what we are doing. Life is fair because life gives us exactly what we ask. If you're not happy with a particular circumstance in your life, no problem. Change it. If you don't want something to happen, no problem. Alter your behavior so that it doesn't happen. You see, folks, the choice is up to us. And this is absolutely brilliant, the way God organized this, because what it gives us is complete and total freedom and personal responsibility so that we can, in fact, be the architects of our life. Life is not fair? Bullshit. Life is fair. It gives us exactly what we wanted. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. Look, I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask for this set of circumstances. I didn't ask for this income. I didn't ask for this family situation or whatever it happens to be. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Some individuals are a little uh, kinder. They say, well, you know, I have to push back a little bit on that. Or I'm not going to give it to you in, in, in soft tones. You did. Because... You have a certain behavior that has a certain cause, and that cause causes an effect, and that effect causes another behavior. Where you are right now might be the summation of many different effects that occur in your life. Look at, don't spend your time formulating an argument to email back to me. Spend your time looking at where you are in your life right now and what you can do to make it better. You are the architect of your reality. Deal with that and do what you can to make it correct. Life is not fair. Bull! Life is perfectly fair and perfectly exacting. Please like, share, comment. Please join my memberships. Bill Shaka, thanking you for attending another edition of the 5-Minute Motivator. Bye.